uh, those are our hub members and really grateful to be sharing the presentation stage with them. And if you want to go ahead and launch the slides, Mitra, we can go ahead and get started. You can go ahead and progress on. So, um, and, and some of you, we gave a talk similar yesterday to the Primary Care Association, so some of this may be uh, repetitive, but remember to repeat and repeat to remember. So, um, we know that there will be a limited supply of vaccines coming to jurisdictions as early as December 2020. As you'll hear throughout this presentation, most have probably seen the news that Pfizer released this week that they are planning to apply for an EUA or emergency youth authorization any day now. And so at the beginning, the supply will be limited and then the, the supply will uh, increase substantially in early 2021 as more vaccine candidates make it through the clinical trial process and more production is able to occur by the companies. We do know that for some of the vaccines, notably the Pfizer uh, product, is that it does require cold chain storage and handling. Um, and that is what we have seen in the phase three critical trials from the refrigerated, which uh, the Moderna product does still need to be refrigerated to the ultra cold temperatures, which is the Pfizer product. We do know that for the most part, vaccination will require a two dose series. There is um, one a uh, candidate that's a one dose that's kind of leading the way thus far, but not likely to be one of the initial vaccine candidates that is uh, makes it through the clinical trial process. And we know that it needs to be separated by 21 or 28 days and that the products are not interchangeable. So if you receive uh, dose one of a certain product, the, the second dose needs to be that same product. The CDC will be providing kits with each shipment. So that includes needles, syringes, prep pads, record cards, as well as a minimum supply of PPE. And the vaccine is going to be shipped from these federally managed distribution centers to the actual provider locations with a minimum order size likely. And we are working on logistics for this ultra cold vaccine, and it is able to be shipped in a container with dry ice that just then has to be recharged after 10 days. So even if your site does not have an ultra cold uh, storage capacity, which most places do not, there is still a possibility that the vaccine can be sent to those centers uh, utilizing dry ice. You can go to the next slide, please. So these are really the three phases of the COVID-19 vaccination program. And so in this first phase, we'll see limited doses available that will really be targeting administration to priority populations, those who are most at risk. And so this will be a very focused administration in regards to who we're, we're targeting. And then as more doses become available, we'll progress through phases to more uh, broad spread distribution where the, the supply is able to meet demands. And this is where we'll see a broad administration uh, further beyond just those targeted initial populations. And then the, the last phase will be kind of ongoing vaccination where we kind of shipped to routine strategy. Um, I'm a pediatrician, so I always have to mention, uh, at this point, the youngest age that the vaccine has been studied is 12, that is the Pfizer product, but uh, we don't believe that, that will, there will be enough data to recommend use. There's certainly a great deal of advocacy to ensure children are included in the clinical trial so that we're able to get the needed information, um, but that's just one of the areas that we're looking at that over time, you know, we're going to learn more about the vaccine products and as clinical trials continue to advance. And so once we get to that third phase, which is more part of a routine strategy of immunization, go ahead to the next slide. So just to dive in a little bit more to the phases in phase one, this is again, a very limited supply. The phase 1A will be targeted at healthcare personnel, both paid and unpaid people serving in healthcare settings who have the potential for direct or indirect exposure to patients or infectious materials, and they're not able to work from home. And then in phase 1B is critical infrastructure or essential workers, individuals who play a key role in keeping a central function of the society going, and they're also unable to socially distance in the workplace. And all of these are subject to change based upon final recommendations from CDC and ACC. Uh, ACIP, the Advisor Committee on Immunization Practices, which has uh, moved up their meeting to meet next week. Um, they have previously been scheduled to meet on December 2nd, and they'll now be meeting on November 23rd. And so we are going to closely monitor the inventory as well as the distribution, and there is likelihood that the vaccine will need to be repositioned depending upon 
how much supply we have and how much uptake of the vaccine occurs because there is a big push. Obviously, this is going to be a scarce resource in the beginning, and we want to make sure that we are providing it and, and utilizing it, all the doses that we are allocated. So I think for those of us who are primary care providers, really this first phase is going to be coordinating vaccination more of your workforce than the patients you necessarily serve. Next slide, please. So in phase two, this is when we have a more uh, robust number of vaccines available, so the supply is able to meet the demand. And this is where we'll shift from those targeted populations to more of a vast mass vaccination strategy. And this will require an expanded vaccination provider network. As I stated, pediatricians typically, I think, are who most would consider primary immunizers along with family practice providers. Um, but this, at least in the beginning, is certainly going to be targeted more towards an adult population. So we are going to need to expand the, the population of individuals who are able to administer vaccine. And this is where in primary care, you can work with local partners to help support those mass vaccination events. Obviously, our health departments play a crucial role in vaccination. Our health departments have certainly been stretched to the brink as they're doing increased testing, contact tracing, case investigation, in addition to the other services they provide. So really, it's gonna take a collaborative effort um, amongst all healthcare personnel to ensure that we're able to get uh, vaccines into arms of our population. And then again, in phase three, that's where it's more routine vaccination and that we would be offering the vaccine to the patient population in various settings. Go ahead to the next slide. So there, I'll just briefly touch on some reporting requirements. So uh, you have to report that you've given the vaccine within 24 hours, and this data is going to be captured by the CDC as well as the state DHHR. And there also is going to be facility level inventory that is closely monitored. What we've heard in talking to Operation Warp Speed or the, the operation that has uh, taken on uh, the production and distribution of the vaccine, this is something that's gonna be very closely monitored and depending upon the initial allocation, subsequent allocations will uh, be based on how well that initial uh, inventory was utilized. Go ahead to the next slide. So uh, for some, this may be new. For others, they may be very familiar with the already uh, existing systems in our state to report vaccines, such as uh, the West Virginia Statewide Immunization Information System. But there is also a, a newer uh, system created through the CDC, which is the Vaccine Administration Management System, or VAMS. And that is a vaccination clinic mobile application that allows patients to register and schedule appointments and also record those vaccine uh, data that meets the CDC reporting requirements. And so this is a, a certainly a newer product. Hopefully many of you, if you are looking at administering vaccines or if you haven't already heard about this, I would certainly encourage, and there will be an email at the end uh, to reach out um, because there are webinars that are being uh, launched. We ask for them every day. We had a CDC team here in West Virginia this week, and we again asked them to share this information with those on the front lines who will be utilizing this application to make sure everyone is familiar with that. Go ahead to the next slide. So um, I think what we've learned in this entire pandemic, and I'll, I'll share a quote from Maya Angelou, is that I've learned that I still have a lot to learn. And so I'm gonna transition here to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Mehta, to talk us through that where we're at in regards to vaccines, but share the caveat that we still have a lot to learn. And so we certainly welcome questions. Sometimes we may not have the answers and we're still looking for them. But I think in this entire process, we're gonna, as we've already experienced in the pandemic, still have a lot to learn. So Mira? All right, thank you, Dr. Costello. Um, if we don't mind, please advancing to the next slide. Um, so everybody, my name is Mira. I'm an infectious diseases specialist at WVU Medicine. Um, and now let's just touch base on some of the vaccine specifics. So this slide is really just showing us the leading vaccine candidates. And I'm sure everyone's been following the news, but the top two are being developed by Pfizer and Moderna. And of course, these are mRNA based vaccines. We'll talk a little bit more about this technology in just a second. Um, but the other two vaccines that are also front runners, um, but behind Moderna and, and Pfizer, um, we have Johnson and Johnson um, and Oxford AstraZeneca, and these utilize a viral vector technology. 
Um, so these vaccines have been tested in slash are being tested in tens of thousands of people. And most of the vaccines are going to be a two dose series. However, Johnson and Johnson is working on a one dose vaccine. Um, Pfizer has has its final safety and um, efficacy results. And so like Dr. Costello said, they are working on an application for an EUA to the FDA any day now. Um, if we could please go to the next slide. All right, so what do we know about mRNA vaccines? So to date, there are no vaccines that use mRNA technology. And so this can be concerning to a lot of people because I'm sure that there are legitimate concerns. Well, we've never used a vaccine that uses this technology before. Is it going to be safe? Um, so I think before we can talk about that, we should talk about how it works. So mRNA, um, if you all remember, mRNA is just genetic information. mRNA provides genetic instructions on how to build proteins. And so what we have here in this in this image here, you're looking at the red coronavirus, and you can see it has a spike protein. Now, the spike protein is an antigen. It's actually the part of the coronavirus that allows it to bind to the human ACE2 receptor and enter the human host cells. And so what the vaccine does, it contains mRNA, so it contains the genetic information to build the spike protein. And the spike protein alone can't cause coronavirus. It's just the antigen of the virus. But what it does is that the mRNA will allow the host cells to produce the spike protein. And then that spike protein will then be um, exposed to the immune system. So the immune system can recognize it, develop antibodies, and elicit an immune response. So that in the future, if a person is exposed to COVID-19, the human body can be ready for it. The immune system will protect us against it. So there are several benefits to mRNA-based vaccines. Number one is that the vaccines are not made with particles derived from the pathogen itself. So when you think about inactivated vaccines that are that contain the pathogen that's been killed or inactivated in some way, or live attenuated vaccine that still contain parts of the pathogen that has been inactivated. Um, when you think about other vaccine technologies, they can contain certain parts derived from the pathogen. But the mRNA vaccine does not. The mRNA is, is um, synthetic genetic information that is just giving you instructions on how to build a spike protein. So therefore, it's non-infectious. It's very, very unlikely for anyone to develop um, COVID-19 from this vaccine um, is non-infectious. The other benefit is that it doesn't enter the host cell nucleus. So unlike DNA-based vaccines, mRNA doesn't have to go into the nucleus. It actually works in the cytosol. Um, it works in the ribosomes. And so it's very unlikely that any component would be integrated into our human DNA. Um, they do not have an oncogenic potential. And then mRNA is rapidly degraded during antigen expression. And so if when you think about vaccines, there's always that concern, well, is there going to be this long-term toxicity if I take the vaccine? Um, but because mRNA is rapidly degraded, theoretically, it lowers the concern that there will be long-term adverse effects from the vaccine. And lastly, mRNA vaccines are faster and cheaper to produce. And this is a benefit during an active pandemic. I know there's a lot of fear about how fast the vaccines are being developed and um, historically it's taken us years and now things are happening, happening very rapidly. Um, but it's important to keep in mind we are in an active pandemic. There are millions infected and in our country alone there's hundreds of thousands of people that have passed away. So we don't have the luxury of time and, and technology has changed. Um, the process of how we develop vaccines have changed. And um, I, I think that mRNA, it can be a very um, efficient way to produce a vaccine when you are in the midst of an active pandemic. Right. If we could please advance to the next slide. So what do we know about COVID vaccine safety? So I work in a hospital and, and I know 
Um, there are some people saying, oh, they're a little bit afraid about the safety. Well, we do have, um, now we have the safety results from the mRNA vaccines. Um, really no serious side effects happened in the safety analysis of these mRNA vaccines. The most common side effects were um, local reactions that were mild to moderate in severity. Um, and most of these happen early on after receiving the vaccine. So within the day or so after receiving the vaccine. Um, to specifically talk about the Pfizer vaccine, there were no serious side effects. The most common was fatigue, which happened in 3.7% um, of the people, and then headache, which was 2%. So very, very low numbers. Um, Moderna was very similar, very, very low um, numbers of adverse effects and very self-limiting things that we would expect with a vaccine, such as the flu shot. You know, it's not uncommon to have fatigue or a headache or things like that. Now, serious adverse effects that occur during phase three trials are thoroughly investigated. So I'm sure you all heard about the Oxford AstraZeneca trial that was stopped because a patient developed transverse myelitis. Um, this it actually ended up that that didn't have anything to do with the vaccine and the patient actually had multiple sclerosis but that study was stopped because they thoroughly investigate serious adverse effects that happen. Um, and historically we know that long lasting side effects from vaccines it's very rare so that is what we do know about safety additionally once these vaccines become available and we start vaccinating people they're going to be monitored very closely. So we do have the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, which provides data on the safety profile of vaccines once they're introduced into the population. And then for the COVID vaccines, there's also going to be vSAFE, which is a vaccine safety ass assessment for essential workers. And it's going to be a smartphone-based surveillance program um, that can perform health checks on vaccine recipients via text messages and email. So it's going to be monitored very, very closely once these become available. Um, if we could please go to the next slide. All right, so what do we know about vaccine efficacy and how effective are these going to be? Well, the FDA is requiring that a COVID vaccine must be at least 50% effective to be approved. Um, it's important to remember a vaccine with 50% efficacy is more effective at disease prevention than no vaccine at all. We do have the final efficacy analysis results from Pfizer, um, and they reported they had a 95 efficacy rate seven days after the second dose of the vaccine. So that is pretty high. Um, and the results were consistent across age, gender, race, and ethnicity. Um, so to just give some more numbers, they evaluated 170 COVID cases. Of those, 162 occurred in the placebo group whereas only eight happened in the vaccine group. And there were 10 cases of severe COVID. Nine of the 10 cases happened in the placebo group. Um, Moderna released some interim efficacy results and they reported their vaccine was 94.5% efficacious, 14 days after the second dose, again, consistent across age, gender, race, ethnicity. Um, their final efficacy percentage may vary. In their study, um, they looked at 95 COVID cases, 90 of them happened in the placebo group, where only five happened in the vaccinated group. And of the 11 severe COVID cases, all of those happened in the placebo group, and they didn't have any in the um, vaccinated group. Just as a quick comparison, the influenza vaccine was 45% effective last year. And we know that the influenza vaccine does prevent illness, it does prevent hospitalization and death. So that's a bit of a comparison historically between influenza and the current COVID vaccines. So with that, um, I will pass things on to the next speaker, but I'd be more than happy to answer any questions at the end. Thanks, and we were able to have Dr. Willenberg, our infectious disease specialist from Marshall join us. So uh, you can go ahead and advance and uh, she's going to talk to us a little bit more about the, the EUA process. Sorry for the delay. I was on another meeting. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit um, in my portion about the EUA itself. So on October the 20th, um, there was an update from the, the VRBAC, which is the Vaccines and Related Biologics Products Advisory Committee. Next slide. 
So this is a committee that's made up of independent folks from the academic community, clinicians, and researchers. They give recommendations to the FDA, which are non-binding, but they are typically followed. So they provide input um, upon a request by the FDA on regulatory actions, such as licensing new vaccines, or on more general topics that um, are helpful to advancing regulatory science. They did meet on October the 22nd, and I'm sure some of you heard about this and possibly even um, watched the webcast that was accessible to the public. They did not um, discuss any specifics about COVID vaccine candidates or vote on recommendations, but they did do a general discussion about development and authorization and the licensure process for vaccines for COVID-19. Next slide, please. So an EUA um, can be requested to allow for the rapid and widespread deployment for administration to millions of people. And we saw this um, so far with remdesivir, we're seeing it with the new monoclonal antibody. Um, it also is included for healthy people and it, it follows an interim analysis for vaccines of an ongoing phase three trial. So they look at a favorable benefit to risk determination to support the EUA. And for vaccines, um, it was determined that they would be required to show um, an efficacy against protection for SARS-CoV-2, either infection or disease of at least 50%, um, which Dr. Mehta brought up. Um, and with a lower bound of greater than 30% for the lower confidence interval. At least half of the subjects would need to be followed for safety and efficacy for at least two months following completion of the full vaccine regimen. So that's two months after the second dose of the vaccine, um, if it's a two dose regimen, which most are. Uh, we would need safety data throughout the clinical development, including that long phase three trial. And that helps us to evaluate reactogenicity, any serious adverse events or any sort of special adverse events. And then we would need to look at sufficient cases of severe COVID COVID-19 that would help us to allow um, us to assess for signals of enhanced disease. Next slide, please. So the reason for follow-up of at least two months is so that we can pick out any um, severe immune or significant immune mediated adverse reactions. And this is because it, it allows us to look for vaccine efficacy during a time period when the adaptive and uh, memory immune response has started, as opposed to early on when the response is due to innate immunity. The, the, the follow-up period for phase three for this trial has not been truncated, and, and that's very important to think about when we think about the other vaccines in the past that we're comparing this against. We want it to be that same sort of trial period where we don't truncate phase three and, and, and we have not. So they are being followed for two months after. Um, that two month period also allows us to assess for any waning protection that would happen very early on um, and look for those signals of enhanced disease. Next slide, please. So after the successful efficacy analysis that would allow us to support the EUA, the process does not stop. Um, so they continue to val um, evaluate the COVID-19 vaccine and we look for ongoing benefit and risk ratios. Um, and then we accrue additional data to support the possible licensure, um, which is the ultimate goal. Um, it also helps to inform labeling. So continued evaluation includes further looking um, uh, for safety data over a longer term uh, with larger numbers of vaccine recipients, as well as in populations that may be a little or have less representation in clinical trials. More um, precise estimate of the vaccine effectiveness. So this allows for following and comparing um, not just seven days after the, vac the second dose of the vaccine, but 14 days after, which allows us to compare the different vaccines against each other. We'll also be able to look at a more robust assessment of their effectiveness regarding infection versus disease. Um, we'll be able to assess the duration of protection, and I think this is one that we're all um, anxiously awaiting, you know, to hear about. But honestly, we may not hear about this for quite some time if it um, proves to have um, a good duration of protection. 
then we also look at the uh, immune biomarkers that could predict protection. And this is looked at along the vaccine process. And if you've looked at the vaccine data that are coming out, you'll see the profiles of the cytokines that match up to a Th1 or Th2 response. And so they continue to evaluate these um, as the process um, progresses. Uh, we also look for, um, continue to monitor for signals of enhanced disease. Next slide, please. So it would be issuing the EUA is contingent upon um, the ability to conduct further evaluation. So the vaccine recipients under the EUA continue to be followed. Um, Dr. Mehta brought up the monitoring system for clinically adverse re or for uh, significant adverse reactions. So one of those systems is the VAERS. Anybody can report a reaction to VAERS. And that shows th those are not further investigated as to causality. What those do elicit is if they see an abnormally high spike in a reaction, then they'll, you know, it, it signals that we need to investigate that further. But as far as individually um, investigating each of those, they are not. It also is followed by observational studies and some of these leverage healthcare system databases. So one of these, an example of this would be the PRISM, which is an FDA database that picks up rare side effects through insurance claim links. So um, that allows, you know, to pick up those rare side effects as time goes on. And then the blinded placebo controlled trial continues as long as it's feasible and as long and then there are strategies to handle loss of follow up. So just because the EUA happens, it does not mean that the trial ends or that the placebo recipients are pulled out of the trial to receive the vaccine. So they're actually continued in their phase unless they choose to withdraw. And, and as a member of a trial, a clinical trial, any clinical trial, you can withdraw at any reason. And one of those reasons that someone might withdraw might be to receive the vaccine that's made available. Next slide, please. So there's a lot to learn. This is such a good slide um, and there'll be more information coming out, but I am very cautiously optimistic and I'm happy to receive questions at the end. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Willenberg. Um, and now we'll go to Dr. Martin, who's gonna talk about uh, the importance of vaccine communications. You can go ahead and advance, Mitra. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be back and, and thank you, uh, Lisa and, and Caitlin for making this opportunity possible. Um, it's often been said that it's, it's not vaccination that's going to get us out of this mess, or excuse me, it's not the vaccine that's going to get, it, get us out of this mess, it's going to be vaccination. And so even with our wonderful technology, if we develop uh, surprisingly efficacious vaccines in a record period of time um, and have the logistics to uh, assure a cold chain, if patients don't accept uh, when offered a vaccine, uh, then, then we have a problem. And unfortunately, again, as if you've been following the news and some of the survey data that's been coming out, it's very discouraging. Uh, vaccine hesitancy, which has been identified uh, by the WHO as one of the greatest global health threats, top 10 last year, uh, predates this pandemic, but has certainly been um, accelerated uh, through this pandemic. And so part of the state approach is going to have involve a coordinated communication strategy in partnership uh, with the Center for Rural Health Development and the Division of Immunization Services uh, with DHHR. Um, a, a group at WVU called the Public Interest Communication Research Lab um, in the Reed College of Media um, it, it has been wisely engaged because these are experts in risk communication which in my experience as someone trained in environmental health is something that we get exposure to, but usually healthcare providers um, are, are, are not familiar with how to communicate risk effectively. And I'll return to that momentarily. So uh, surveys are, are undergoing uh, or have been uh, initiated statewide as well as some uh, qualitative research as well involving focus groups to understand what people's uh, concerns and fears are about the vaccine and how we can effectively address them. And I think that's an absolutely critical part uh, of our success moving forward. Uh, the goal is of course to develop clear, consistent messages that we can share uh, throughout uh, the state by these various partners to address vaccine hesitancy and misinformation, which is widespread. Uh, hopefully the next slide, please. 
Well, this is a very interesting slide from the WHO uh, that I'm sure resonates with you in your clinical experience. Uh, there really is a spectrum of people's uh, attitude and, and behaviors towards uh, vaccination. Uh, and let me say that I would be on the far left hand of this spectrum. Um, I absolutely love vaccines. If there was a plague vaccine that could be offered to me, even though I'm not at much risk of the plague, I would gladly take the plague vaccine. I think vaccines are, are wonderful. However, we have to recognize that much of how we speak about vaccines in public health uh, has been rightly criticized in my opinion. Um, and we don't have much time to get into this in any depth, but I'd encourage you to listen to the videos and read the writings uh, of a person by the name of Peter Sandman, and that is S-A-N-D-M-A-N. He has a website, psandman.com. I have no financial relationship with him. Um, but you can also Google his name on, on YouTube and get a lot of his valuable videos and training sessions. And he's really a guru in risk communication. And over 30 years ago, uh, coined the concept uh, of a formula that risk, the way people perceive the risk is a combination of two functions, hazard plus outrage. What he means by hazard is the technical aspect. And everything you've heard in the presentation today is incredibly important technical information. But Peter Sandman points out that simply conveying information to people does not change their attitudes and does not change their behaviors if you do not first address their outrage. What he means by outrage are all of the subjective uh, factors that go into how individuals perceive risk, um, their familiarity, uh, whether they're coerced or not, those kinds of factors. And he points out that when you rank people by the technical hazard versus how upset or afraid they are, there's a very poor correlation. In fact, the correlation coefficient is about 0.2, meaning that about 4% of the variation in one is explained by the other. And you already know this, uh, th this concords with your personal experience. Uh, people go to the beach and worry about getting uh, attacked by a shark. Uh, on travel experiences, they get worried about being killed by a terrorist event. Um, they worry about the plane crash. Uh, on the other hand, do not worry about the car crash, which of course, from a hazard or technical perspective, the risk of a car crash on the way to the airport is far greater than the airplane. And the reason for that disconnect is because of this concept that there is both a technical component to how people receive risk, but also a subjective component. And so Peter Sandman criticizes a lot of our messaging in public health about vaccine uh, because we don't address those subjective factors. And so um, I'm gonna pose a question to you in the chat box, um, which, which I've just opened up. And I'm gonna ask you a question. And, and the question is, a statement that you often hear from anti-vaccine people. Uh, the statement is this, and what I want you to do is after I provide the statement, I want you to say whether you believe this to be a true statement or a false statement. That's all you got to write, true or false in the chat box. The federal government compensates people for adverse effects from vaccination. Please type in the chat box whether you believe that to be a true or a false statement. We have a skewed group here. I'm seeing uh, actually a slight predominance of true, uh, but there is there are some falses. Give it a little bit longer. W when I made that, uh, did that same exercise yesterday with the Primary Care Association, uh, Lisa's there, she can, she can be my witness. The, the, re the responses were overwhelmingly that that was a false statement. Uh, but we've got some knowledgeable people like Kathy Moffitt here, so that's kind of not fair. Uh, that, that's actually a true statement. Um, in the 1990s, a program called the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program was established. I have served as a consultant for that program. Graduate of our residency program works for them full time. So it is true that the federal government does compensate people for alleged, I use the word alleged, adverse uh, reactions, uh, including Guillain-Barre syndrome from the primary series of vaccine and seasonal uh, influenza vaccine. Um, and the point that Peter Sandman makes by that is to say that, you know, uh, when an individual takes a, a, a pharmaceutical, there's a lot of information in the product insert about all of the potential adverse consequences of that drug. Um, when you undergo a surgery, your surgeon routinely communicates the um, unlikely uh, uh, but, but real risk of an infection or cutting some other uh, structure inadvertently. 
And we're much more transparent in communicating about those than we are with vaccines. Uh, in public health, again, by the best of intentions, we tend to not talk about some of those factors because we fear with the best of intentions that if we say those things, people will do the wrong thing. And we see the data, we accept the data that's already been presented in this uh, wonderful session today. And we say, well, look, that, that's the important point. And we don't wanna confuse people. The problem with that is, of course, with social media and all of the avenues out there and the, the prominence of the anti-vaccine movement, people will find out about those things. And unfortunately, when they find out about them, it confuses them and it erodes their trust with us. So the message that I have for you very briefly, uh, learn more from Peter Sandman about risk communication. He does have some specific information um, about vaccine hesitancy and how to get the messaging correct. Uh, I would argue that perhaps we need to spend more time on some of these subjective factors uh, that individuals are experiencing now. Uh, yes, we have broken a record. Uh, we know why we shouldn't be worried about that, but our patients are going to be legitimately worried about that, I would argue. And we have to frame our, our message to address some of those legitimate concerns. We have never ever been here before where we are going to initiate a widespread vaccination of a vaccine that has only been approved by an EUA. An EUA is not equivalent to FDA approval. We should be transparent about that. We should be transparent about saying that we could detect adverse effects that were not detected in the phase three studies. The numbers and the statistics dictate that much like COX-2 selective uh, non-steroidals, it is possible that adverse effects may be seen that we haven't yet detected. So I think by paying greater attention to some of these subjective factors and being more transparent in our communication, our, I would argue they're gonna find out many of these things anyway, um, and, and paying attention to those subjective factors and not focusing exclusively on the technical part, I think we may have some greater success. And by collaborating with the public uh, interest research group at WVU, I, I really applaud the state effort for including that key component of risk communication. Thank you very much. And I think we have some time for additional questions. Well, thank you all so much. Um, that was really excellent. It was great to have all four of you be able to present today. Um, so we'll go into some of the Q&As. We did get one question in, um, I believe, halfway through the presentation, and that was, once we get a COVID-19 vaccine, will it be feasible in the future to distinguish between immunity obtained through the vaccine versus natural infection? For example, will we be able to run a blood test for antibody in the future to check whether the patient had immunity due to natural infection versus vaccination? Hi, this is Mira. Um, I'll take a stab at answering this one, but I don't think I'm going to be able to provide much information. Um, I don't think that we know that yet. Um, so, of course, we do the serology testing sometimes with other viruses like hepatitis B and, and you can tell if you had it due to natural, who cleared it due to natural infection versus um, or who has immunity due to vaccines. Um, I don't think that we know the answer to this yet. We of course we don't know how long immunity lasts by vaccination, um, that's the million dollar question, or even how long it lasts by clearing the active um, infection. Um, we also know that sometimes it takes a certain time to develop antibodies. Um, I think that ongoing studies will be able to reveal some more answers about this and I think that this is a really really great well thought out question and I'd like to know the answer to it too but for right now I, I'm not sure um, the full answer to that question but I think it's a great one. I would agree. I was on a call yesterday with a national organization and I think the, the immunologist from Hopkins pointed out like at the very least we would probably only know if people have natural immunity for the past 11 months because that's the only time that we've been dealing with this disease. So some of this will require ongoing uh, study and evaluation um, because we're, this is still very much a, a new virus and disease. Thank you, Lisa, um, for adding the email for any questions or concerns regarding the enroll enrollment process. So um, uh, be sure to include that in the recap email so everyone has access to that. I have one more question. I mean, if I happen to check for antibody level right now for any patient, 
the IgG antibody for the COVID. Okay, now those antibody tests, I know that they have said that the immunity is currently lasting three to six months. That is what they are saying, even with the natural infection, because people are getting infected second time also. Okay, do you, are you aware about how long these antibodies are there in the blood with the natural infection that we can really do blood tests and it will show up? Sorry, is your is your question about how how long those antibodies from natural infection would would last? Would be detectable with the blood test that we have right now. Right, I don't I don't know the exact answer to that question um, either. I know that it's it's variable. So um, the the amount of antibodies that people show um it can it can be variable and it can differ and some people there have been reports that some people who have um had covid sometimes their antibodies haven't been detectable um so i, I think it really just varies I, I don't i don't have a specific time um in mind about how long that happens yeah, and I think, you know, those um, tests don't distinguish between neutralizing antibodies either. There's some newer work uh, that just came out about that recently about tests that might be used to look for neutralizing antibodies. And, and those are really the more important antibodies that help to fight infection and the duration that they last um, is variable as well. So I think, you know, more, more information is needed about all of those to give you a better answer. And I do Great know that the CDC continues to look into that antibody question and the true, you know, is there true reinfection? We still have those questions in West Virginia. There was a study back um, in July and what the CDC had found is that, you know, they, they weren't really seeing true what you would call reinfection. I think since that time, there's been additional concern that that does actually happen. Um, and the CDC then would just you know, our health departments would consider that a new case. So I, I definitely echo, pun intended, the um, comments of my colleagues in regards to we still have a lot to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we didn't get any other questions in the chat. Did anyone have comments or questions? You can feel free to unmute as well if you prefer that. I would take, I guess, the floor to please welcome any suggestions. Um, as uh, many have mentioned, we did talk to the Primary Care Association yesterday, along with health departments who were invited to that. We're trying to do our best to inform the public. And as Dr. Martin mentioned, you know, there is a robust uh, campaign being developed to help uh, have information available for healthcare professionals, partners, the the public, but we would welcome any feedback on other items that you know individuals want to know about and we tried to cover what we've heard about you know in regards to safety efficacy and the process and, and messaging but welcome any feedback that individuals may have you can also email it to me but appreciate the opportunity to talk about this for this week's echo Absolutely, thank you. And I do want to reiterate that in the recap emails and the reminder emails, we have that online case form, which you can directly go to and submit any questions that you'd like addressed in future sessions as well. So we have a little under 15 minutes left of the session. We do have a short poll at the end, but I don't wanna cut the session short if there are any further questions from anyone or the hub members would like to share anything else with the group. Um, the, the only other thing I would share is that um, the state is receiving a supply of the Lilly monoclonal antibody product, uh, Bamlavinab, which I'm still trying to learn how to say, um, but uh, it is uh, coming to West Virginia. I'm sure there's been media reports that individuals have seen. Um, it is a primary an outpatient uh, treatment for those early in the course, I know that Dr. Willenberg as well as uh, Dr. Mehta have been involved in that process as well. I think when it comes to vaccines, it's still unclear of, you know, vaccine indication after having 
potentially received one of those products like a monoclonal antibody or convalescent plasma, but um, it, it is uh, going to be available for patients here in West Virginia. I was told the shipments will likely receive sometime today at the, the hospitals across the state. There were uh, 12 initial hospitals that will have that medication. But uh, I think Dr. Reese in her next uh, discussion of the Project ECHO on December 3rd is going to talk about therapeutics, and I'm sure she will cover that product as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And if there are any further questions or comments or resources that you'd like to share with the group, um, and this goes for everyone, just feel free to shoot me an email anytime and I'll make sure to distribute it to everyone. Um, so if there's nothing else further, I can go right into the announcements for next time and I can launch the poll. Um, so thank you very much to Drs. Lisa Costello, Willenberg, uh, Dr. Martin, and Meta. We really appreciate your time and this was just such a wonderful presentation and so helpful and um, very timely for sure. So thank you all so much for your time.